So today I want to make a more of a different style share. It's halacha, but it's a little more, I guess, in the uh, yeshiva approach of learning. And that is, I want to have a deeper understanding in the uh, rabbinical prohibitions, isure derabanan, and how exactly does an isure derabanan work, and what exactly is the uh, movement behind the isure derabanan. And we'll, we'll explain by Hashem in today's uh, share. Before we begin, as always, uh, this should not be relied upon for halachic psak, and a rub should be consulted. The Nesivis HaMishpat in Simon Reish Lamedal writes a very interesting halach. He doesn't explain where he's coming from, but he writes that if someone does a rabbinic prohibition by accident, Bishogeg, he does not need to do anything to, in order to get Kapara. Let me explain. When uh, a person does a biblical prohibition by accident, Shogig, he needs to do something to, to do, he needs to do tshuva, he needs to bring a carbon, he needs to bring a carbon chatas. Even though it was by accident, he still did something wrong. He still needs to do something to cleanse his neshama. He still needs to do to receive repentance. Says the Nesivas HaMishpat, when it comes to rabbinic prohibitions, that's not the case. Rabbinic prohibitions, if you do a rabbinic prohibition by accident, you do not need to receive kapara. An example would be, you have a, a, a burger, and you're within the six hours, and you have a cup of milk by accident, you forgot. That's only a rabbinic prohibition, for reasons that we're not going to discuss right now. That's at most a rabbinic prohibition. So it says in the Sivas, if you did it by accident, don't worry about it. You can move on. You don't have to say al chait. You can move on. So, what's the explanation for this? So, if Shimon Shkop, in Shari Yoisha Shal Aleph Perig Yud, explains that the deeper understanding behind the opinion of the Nesivas is that the Nesivas understood that there's an inherent difference between biblical obligate b- prohibitions and rabbinic prohibitions. Biblical prohibitions are what in the yeshiva world we call isure chefza, meaning that when the Torah says not to eat something, it means that there's inherently spiritually something wrong with this item. This item is a poison on a spiritual level pig is a poison. And if you drink poison even by accident, you still need to go to the hospital. So therefore, if you do do a biblical prohibition, even if it's by accident, you still need a kapar, you still need to do tshuva, you still need to fix it, because at the end of the day, you have poison, your neshama still has poison in it. Understands the nesivis that when it comes to rabbinic prohibitions, that's not the case. They're not isuri chefza. What they are is isuri gavra, meaning that when the rabbanans say not to eat a certain item, the Rabbanan say not to eat wine that was touched by a non-Jew. In many cases, that's only rabbinic. If the Rabbanan say, let's say, not to eat this, this, this mixed item, it means that there's nothing inherently wrong with the food. There's nothing spiritually wrong with the food. The food is fine. On a biblical level, there's nothing wrong. There's no poison. There's no inherent poison with this food. So what's the prohibition? What the real prohibition is, the Rabbanans say to do something, or not to do something, you have to listen to them and not rebel against them. Meaning the deeper understanding is that when the Rabbanan create a prohibition, they're not actually inherently saying that there's something wrong with this food. They're saying, we don't want you to eat it for whatever reason. And if you do eat that, you didn't put poison in your body, but you rebelled against us, and that's wrong. So says the Nesivas, because there's nothing inherently wrong with this item, the whole issue of eating this food is because it's an act of rebellion against the Rabbanon who told you not to eat it. Therefore, if you did it by accident, it's not considered a rebellion. No one would say that you're rebelling against the rabbis by doing something by accident. You weren't thinking. And because there's nothing inherently wrong with this food, or with this prohibition, there's nothing inherently spiritually, there's no poison. It's an iser gavra. It's, the iser is on the person, not chepsa. It's not on the item itself. Therefore, you don't need tshuva. Rabbi Chonu Asim and Kaivitz Arasim and Ches, Sivkat and Tezvav writes the same thing. He says, Lefim HaShikas and Nesivitz HaMishpat Sim and Reish Lamedal, Deba'ever Iser Darabonim According to Nesivis, that you don't need tshuva when you do a rabbinic prohibition by accident. As opposed to biblical prohibitions. Venir Lefiza says, I understand. When it comes to rabbinic prohibitions, the actual action itself is not the problem. The real issue is not the eating the food. It's not, that's not the real issue. Obviously, that's what you're not allowed to do. But the major understanding behind Isuri Darabanan is you can't re- 
rebel against the rabbis. And if they say not to do something, you have to listen to that. Not because there's something inherently wrong with the food, but because you have to listen to the rabbonon. And therefore, because you did it by accident, and therefore, because you did it by accident, if you did it by accident, no one would call that an act of rebellion, and therefore you do not need tshuva. However, it should be noted that there were many achronim who disagree with the Nesivas. The Asim Darais and Klal Yud, and in his Sefer Beis HaOitzer, Chilagal Simkuf Chav Beis disagrees. He says that rabbinic prohibitions are could be Isuri Chavza, meaning there is something inherently wrong with that on a rabbinic level. There's a poison here. And if even if you did it by accident, you need Shuva. Uh, the Briska Rav on the Rambam, Hilchas Chametz and Matzah, Paragal of Achlatas also writes that. Um, the Mishnah Bura in Sharetzian writes that if you break Shabbos, even if it was on a rabbinic level and you did it by accident, you still need to do tshuva. So, and according to some, there's such a concept of fasting for 40 days. Obviously, we don't do this, but there is such a concept that you need tshuva, even though it's only a rabbinic prohibition. I want to explain one more thing. That is, according to the Nesivas, let's focus on the Nesivas for a second. According to the Nesivas, all rabbinic prohibitions are not poison. There's nothing wrong with these items. Uh, it's just that uh, you're not allowed to rebel against the rabbis. So the question is, why? Why is there nothing wrong with these items? So, it seems that according to Rav Yosef Engel, the way Rav Yosef Engel explains it, and the way uh, in Asven Der Isa, and the way um, the Meshachachma explains it, the understanding is that the reason why the Rabbanon did not create a rabbinic prohibition, uh, 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 um, they did not create something inherently wrong with this item, meaning that if this food is only rabbinic, pro- rabbinically prohibited, it doesn't become a poison. There's nothing inherently wrong with that food. The issue is you have to listen to the Rabbanon, and if you eat it, you didn't put a poison in your body, but you rebelled against the rabbis, and that itself is the issue. It seems that the understanding of the Meshachachma in Parsha Shaift and Perik Yudzai and Pasuk Yid Aleph, and I think also the Rav Yosef Engels itself, is that they understood that according to the Nesivists, the Rabbanon don't have the ability to make something inherently poisonous poisonous, to make something in Isr Chetza, meaning when Hashem created the world and He gave the power over to the Rabbana and to Paskin, they don't have the ability to take a food that's on a spiritual level, it's fine, they don't have the ability to make it inherently not fine. The most they can do is put a ban on the person not to eat the food, but they can't change the spiritual makeup of the food itself. That's what it seems to be according to the... Um, the Nesivas, uh, according to the Asim Deraisa and the Meshachachma. However, I believe that the Munkacher Rebbe disagrees. The Munkacher Rebbe in Chelik um, Bey Simin Yudches of Minchas Alazar, he writes, and it's not relevant right now for his discussion, it's more for how he perceives this. He, he discusses many uh, rabbinic prohibitions, and he cites the Nesivas' opinion that rabbinic prohibitions are Isser Gavra, that the prohibition is on the person, there's nothing inherently wrong with the item, but he says that there's an exception to that rule, and that is wine that was touched by a Nanju. Wine that was touched by a Nanju, in most cases, is only rabbinic. But says the Minchas Alazar, based on um, certain stringencies are revolving around that prohibition, he says that prohibition is actually worse. And that prohibition is actually one of the rare cases where even the Nesivas would agree is in a Sechefza, meaning he says that even the Nesivas would agree that if you drink a cup of wine that was touched by an Anju, even the Nesivas would agree that that becomes an Sechefza, and you would need Tshuva even if you did it by accident, because that wine, although it's only rabbinic, does become a poison. That's what the Min Chasalazer says. Now, the that has halachic ramifications, obviously, for not, not right now, but it's, it's clearly, I don't, I don't believe that the Mun Rebbe does not understand the Nesivas the same way that the Meshachachma does. Because according to the Meshachachma, the reason why rabbinic prohibitions are not Isuri Chavta, that there's nothing, they don't become poisonous, is because the Rabbanon don't have the ability to do that. That's not, you know, they have a lot of strengths and they have a lot of abilities, but that's not one of them. So I don't understand how there could be an exception to the rule. If, either they have the ability or they don't have the ability. It seems that according to the Minchas Lazar, the Rabbanon do have the ability but they chose not to. 
they chose to only make the food, to only put a ban on the person from eating the food. They chose not to change the spiritual makeup of the food itself. But they had the ability, and therefore he says that in certain circumstances, when they were compelled to do so, like uh, wine that was touched by a Anju, which is very, very stringent, as is evident from the Chachma Sadam and other Rishonim, uh, other, he quotes other Rishonim, it seems that they did it. They did make it an Isser uh, Chefza. Again, this is a little more of the yeshivish approach, but uh, questions can be sent to avizakatinsky at gmail.com, A-V-I-Z-A-K-U-T-I-N-S-K-Y at gmail.com.